Hello, welcome to episode 80 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, a thousand one movies you must see before you die. It is the 1st of October 2016 and it is the beginning of our 31 Nights of Horror. That was a tribute to the to the great Chill Pilgrim who used to do 31 Nights of Horror. It's not 31 Nights of Horror, but I will be trying to get an Epic Film Challenge to review up every single day of October 2016, just to give you a little bit of kind of background if you haven't seen my up my kind of video announcing this, but basically last few years, me and Connie, my fiance, we have decided to kind of take the month of October and just watch all horror films. And, and in some cases, like last year, watch a horror film for every day of, of October. I, I, horror is definitely my least favorite genre. I, I love certain horror films. I think that certain horror films are just amazing. Uh, but there are so many horror films that I think are rubbish as well. I'm sure that's the same with any genre really. You get crappy action films, you get crappy romantic comedies, you know, you get crappy dramas. But to me, th th this just feels like there's a lot more crappy horror out there. Maybe that's just me being biased because I'm not the biggest fan of horror. But I do enjoy it, and so October is always a cool time for me to push myself to watch them because throughout the year, I'm not really inclined to really dig into those films. So, um, I do watch horror throughout the year, but nowhere near as, as, as much as, as most people, I think. Um, so October is a prime opportunity for me to get into the spirit of it with everyone else and to watch more horror films. So I'm doing this challenge, you know, a thousand one movies you must see before you die, and there's an index at the back by genre. So I've looked through all the horror films and I've picked 31 uh, to, to go through and I don't know, don't know if I'll even get to all of them, we'll see what happens, we'll, we'll try and get this done. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of film watching but hopefully I can get it and, uh, and there'll be me doing these solo reviews of the films that Connie wouldn't be interested in watching or refuse to watch, which is fair enough. Uh, but me and Connie will be covering some of the big heavy hitters, you know, some of the, the most famous horror films of all time. We're going to be covering a lot of those, talking about ones and, and some of our controversial opinions on some of these classics that people love, you know, these horror films. So I'm really excited actually and amped up to be talking about both the ones that you've all heard about before, but also the films that you've probably never heard of uh, and, and whether I like them or not, whether it's a film you'll see before you die. So I'm really excited that and, and hoping that this will be a cool thing. Maybe we can do it again next year if there's enough... Uh, of the horror films left in the book because there's not that many there's there's you know well there's a lot but there's compared to like drama and comedy you know the, the horror kind of section in the the book a thousand movies you must see before you die is pretty slim nevertheless the first one we're starting with and that's probably the biggest preamble to one of these reviews so far but it's going to be a short review probably the unknown 1927 we're kicking off with a silent film uh, and i'll try and pepper it so that there'll be a couple of me doing solo ones and, a, and then connie doing one so you know you can get a healthy mix of both of us uh or me and and then me and her uh, this is one she wouldn't have been interested in seeing and uh, that'll be said for most of the ones that i do on my own but this is a really interesting one directed by todd browning who did the classic Dracula, which we will be talking about this month, and also uh, a few months ago, or a couple months ago, I covered Freaks, uh, which was, I think, the film he did after Dracula, I think. Anyway, uh, this felt quite similar to Freaks in the beginning, uh, The Unknown, because uh, it starts off in a circus and it very much had the same kind of visual feel of Freaks. I, I since learned that Todd Brandon grew up in a circus, and so he brought a lot of that to the films that he made, and certainly I can see the link between this and Freaks, and also him having a, a history in the circus. Uh, the star of the film is the one and only Lon Chaney, you know, the man of a thousand faces, legendary character actor who played, you know, just things like from, you know, The Hunchback of Notre Dame to Phantom of the Opera. Uh, you know, that's probably his most famous one, I think. But he was definitely one of those guys who just could really inhabit a role. I mean, look at guys like Boris Karloff as well, who were in these horror films and could really get into the unique characters that they were given in their films. In this film, he plays Alonzo, who is a guy who has no arms, works in the circus, and he's fallen in love with kind of the the girl, you know, the, the, the kind of the leading girl of the film, uh, played by Joan Crawford, uh, another legendary uh, actress there. So you got you know Lon Chaney, Joan Crawford, you know these these big name actors. When you you look back now, I suppose retroactively, I'm not sure where their careers lined up, where they they started becoming big stars. But Joan Crawford definitely is a name I've heard a lot over the years, and Lon Chaney. And so they both started in this together. And he, he Alonzo, he he kind of falls for Joan Crawford's character. Um, but she has a phobia of men holding on to her or, or, or touching her in any way, using their hands. And it makes me wonder because I think that her father run the circus or there's some guy running the circus and he doesn't seem like a very nice guy. It makes me wonder if she grew up under abuse, uh, being hit, stuff like that, whether that was kind of a... <clears throat> 
uh, an under the surface thing that you could read into if you wanted to, but she's afraid of hands and you know, don't touch me and stuff. And there's another guy, kind of a strong man, I forget his name now, uh, and he's kind of like you know, big muscly and he's like, and he, he loves the girl too. So you got this love triangle here and the strong man is like, you know, look at my muscles, you know, I love you, my, my, my soul bleeds for you, come on, let's, you know, let me grab you and hold you and kiss you. And she's like, get away from me with your hands and stuff and, you know. And Lancini's character's like, yeah, you want to stay away from those men, all of them, because they will just, you know, the things they can do with their hands. And of course, he has no arms. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to spoil things, um, but but it, it progresses in a way that's quite interesting. There's a couple of twists there that are, are really kind of, wow, okay, oh, they're doing that, you know. Uh, it's not very long. I think some of the film was lost. Uh, the, the current print that is available is 50 minutes long. But it didn't feel like it was too short, you know. That it had every beat that I felt like the story needed. Uh, and it's really about Alonzo trying to win the love of this girl. Uh, and, and she clearly loves him a lot, but whether she loves him in the way that he wants is a whole other thing uh, entirely. The thing that this film is so good at, apart from the fact that it's shot well, you know, it, it's done well, and also I loved all the bits where Lon Chaney's character was using his feet, you know, and he's like bringing his feet up to his face and like sparking up cigarettes and stuff, playing guitar and everything, and you know, I don't know whether Lon Chaney did that for real, whether they had a guy underneath the chair or something, I don't know, but it was impressive either way, and I certainly didn't question it and go, oh, that doesn't look real. So, I, I don't know, maybe Lon Chaney is just the man, and he, he learned to do all this stuff with his feet. The climax of the film is shocking, uh, and there's one moment in the film where I just feel like his performance, Lon Chaney, was so powerful. Uh, like I was just like almost in, in a little bit of shock at what was going on and playing out in front of me on screen. Uh, amazing little performance there in that, that one scene that I'm thinking of. And yeah, overall, is it a film you must see before you die? I'm going to say yes. It's not very long. Uh, for a silent film, it moves very, you know, the pace is very good, I think. And the story is cool. It feels like like an, an episode of like maybe the Twilight Zone, not quite the Twilight Zone, but like kind of like uh, you know, like can you believe it? You know, was it was it uh, straight? Was that that, that show Ripley something? I forget what it is. Leave a comment down below. I forgot what the, the show is, but like you know, uh, it's like when they show a story, like is it true or is it or is it not true? Just like creepy kind of like uh, anthology style story. It felt like, um, which was really cool. So, yeah, is it fun to see before you die? Yes, I think it's, it's worth your time. It's from a, a director who would go on to direct, you know, one of the most iconic horror films of all time in Dracula for Universal. Um, and you can definitely see where the route started. You know, I think just the film looked really good and was set up well, was paid off well. A really, really good little film. Uh, no, a really great little film, I will say, as well. Yeah, and there, there's something kind of a little bit disturbing about it as well that, uh, that definitely fits under the horror banner, I feel. So if you want to stop watching now, you can. But to end this all off, I'm going to go into some spoiler territory. So as it turns out, Alonzo, Lon Chaney's character actually has arms. Yes, 20 minutes into the film it's revealed he actually has arms. He puts his arms inside a corset like this and throughout the day he has clothes over it so no one can tell and then he takes them out. He has a friend who's a dwarf, this little guy, helps him out of the corset and things like that and he knows he has arms and kind of protects his kind of secret I suppose. And he's a criminal, Lon Chaney, so he's kind of you know taken away what they could use to identify him with because he has two thumbs as well. Uh, and then in the middle of the film, he ends up strangling, I guess, the father of the girl he's in love with. And she doesn't see his face, but she sees the two thumbs. And so he, he runs off and stuff and comes back and, you know, she's none the wiser. Because obviously he has no arms as far as she's concerned. He starts making moves on her and stuff like that. It seems to be going well. Uh, and then his dwarf friend reminds him, look, if you get married to this girl on your wedding night, she's going to see that you have arms. And he's like, she won't care, she'll accept me anyway. And I like that they included that, that he was still adamant that, no, I don't care, even if she finds out that I've got arms, you know, she, she'll love me no matter what. And the dwarf says, well, look, she's going to see the two thumbs, she's going to know that you killed, you know, her, her father. And he's like, you're right. And the look on Lon Chaney's face, I mean, it's an incredible scene between him and his friend, the dwarf, because uh, it, it comes to a point where there's no intertitles, there's no text on the screen, and you just see Lon Chaney sit back and think about it, and his face changes, his expression changes, and you understand what he's thinking. Cuts to the dwarf. His expression, he's laughing, and then it changes, and he knows what he's thinking. And he's like, no, you can't do that. 
and they never say it. They never say that he's going to go have an operation to get his arms cut off. You just know it through seeing their faces. It's an incredible piece of acting, I think. I just, well, I suppose not. I suppose it's probably in your head that maybe he'd want to have it cut off. But I mean, I just think that the performances really sell this kind of, it's, I mean, there's, you don't even see the mouths moving. It's true silent cinema at its absolute purest. And you get the story without anyone saying anything because it's been built up to this point where, where you kind of can see where it's going, I suppose. Maybe you could say it's predictable. But to me, I just thought it was very well done. He goes and has his, his arms cut off for real. So he's truly armless to, to kind of be with this girl who has the, the phobia of men touching her. And while he's away for a few weeks getting his arms cut off, the strong man woos the girl and she gets over her, her fear of hands and it's like, oh no, and he's having his arms cut off. Alonzo comes back after the few weeks and the girl is like, oh, it's so great to see you. Where have you been? Got exciting news and all that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, <laughs> she says, now we can get married. And, and Alonzo's like, yeah, we can. And she's like, yeah, I'll go get him now. And that's when it starts to dawn on him. And she brings out the strong man who's got his arms wrapped around her saying, yeah, we got over her fear and everything. Again, I'm kind of, I'm very much kind of adding dialogue here, but you know, that's the story that's being told. And Lon Chaney's face. Alonzo's face when he realizes that she's going to get married to this strong man, that she's got over this fear of arms and he's now had his arms truly cut off. He starts laughing. And at, at first it's like, you know, he, he just sees the funny side in it, you think, and then his eyes start welling up and then he start, his head starts tilting back and the laughing gets more manic and then they start going, what's going on? You know, at first they were laughing along with it, then they start getting scared and he's laughing and he's laughing and his eyes are filling up with tears and he realizes what he's done, the horror of this situation, he's had his arms amputated for nothing. It's like an incredibly powerful moment, you know, I just... It's all building to that, and I just think that the ending and that scene in particular is so affecting. It's it's a real horrifying moment, you know, and that for me is really what makes this film great. It's all it's all about that one moment, and that sometimes is, is how it is with films. You know, you can watch a great film and you can enjoy everything about it: the writing, the directing, the acting. I think I said the acting already. The script, you know, the the cinematography, the music, everything. You can appreciate every single aspect about it. But, you know, in, in one week's time, in one month's time, in one year's time, one decade's time, it's the moments that stand out, the moments that stick in your head that really, really get to you and kind of um, stay in your memory. And that, to me, is the one thing I'll always think about with this film. And the one thing I'll always think about probably with silent horror in general. It's not a very horror film, you know? It's not like, oh, it's horrific and it's spooky and scary. It's just like a weird kind of like, just almost body horror, I suppose, in its earliest form, perhaps, or one of the earlier forms. Um, you know, anyway, I had a lot of great things to say about this film. Uh, if you got this far, you either don't care, in which case, just, just watch it anyway, um, or you have seen it, and, uh, and thank you for watching. I got nothing more to say, but I really, really enjoyed this one, and it really surprised me.